Welcome to Charity Village Connects. I'm your host, Mary Barrel. That's the sound of a hummingbird pollinating our world and making it a better place. The hummingbird is Charity Village's logo because we strive, like the industrious hummingbird, to make connections across the nonprofit sector and help make positive change. Over this series of podcasts, we'll explore topics that are vital to the nonprofit sector in Canada. Topics like diversity, equity, and inclusion, mental health in the workplace, the gap in female representation in leadership, and many other subjects crucial to the sector. We'll offer insight that will help you make sense of your life as a nonprofit professional, make connections to help navigate challenges, and support your organization to deliver on its mission. At the end of a challenging year that disproportionately impacted the nonprofit sector, we wanted to bring you an episode of celebration. While we recognize and acknowledge the hard work and dedication of the thousands of people across the country who put their heart and soul into achieving great results in the nonprofit sector, we wanted to celebrate those whose efforts went above and beyond during this historically difficult time. In November 2021, Charity Village launched our inaugural Charity Village Conference and Awards. The awards honor the commitment, passion, and drive shown by those whose boundless energy was focused on making meaningful and outstanding contributions to their organizations, their communities, and their mission. We announced the winners at our virtual nationwide celebration of excellence in the nonprofit sector. Meanwhile, my staff were all celebrating from their homes as well. So it was thrilling and it was this kind of surreal experience. Is it real? Did it really happen? Yelling like, ah! And I think that was the feeling that we all had. It was an exciting moment. It felt amazing to have that recognition in this type of award, especially from an organization like Charity Village, which completely understands the world of nonprofit and how things work. So it's kind of great to be recognized in an area of our peers. So it was really special. It felt very surreal and humbling. To be featured amongst a list of over 500 extraordinary candidates from across the nation was just unbelievable. It was amazing. There might have been a little bit of screaming and dancing and all of that, so we were very excited to to receive that award. As you might guess, you just heard from some of our winners about what it felt like to hear that they won a 2021 Charity Village Award. The awards were focused on outstanding achievements in four core areas that are crucial to the future success and resilience of every nonprofit organization and the sector itself. Best fundraising campaign, commitment to mental health in the workplace, outstanding achievements in diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, excellence and innovation in youth engagement, and the most outstanding impact of an individual. All awards were judged by independent subject matter experts in each category. To level the playing field, we split the categories into small and larger organizations with separate awards in each category for organizations with over 20 staff and for organizations with under 20 staff. Since the awards were announced, our communication channels have been buzzing with questions about what the winners did that really made them stand out and help them win the votes of our expert judges. So now it's our chance to share their amazing stories with all of Canada. So let's pop the cork and open the celebrations by talking to our winners to find out what they think made the difference for them to win their Charity Village Award. One of the biggest challenges that nonprofits and charities faced in the last two years was how to transform their fundraising strategies as repeated lockdowns and social distancing restrictions decimated traditional in person fundraising events. Many nonprofits made valiant efforts to continue fundraising in new and innovative ways that we thought were important to celebrate and to learn from. So let's start with the fundraising category. The Etobicoke Humane Society was winner of the best fundraising campaign with a staff of over 20. But the amazing thing is the society is entirely run on volunteers with no paid staff or government funding and is completely dependent on their volunteers for fundraising. 
We interviewed Tori Gass, communications director, to learn what she thought put the Etobicoke Humane Society over the top and into the winner's circle. We did have to approach this holiday campaign a little differently than years past. It was fully virtual. And because we had to make up some money that we had missed out on in-person events throughout the year, we had to offer different things. We had traditionally always done just the outreach, asking for donations. And then we had done e-cards that people could share. We still had the e-cards, which are very popular. But we also added things like a photo contest. And that was a big draw. We also put a lot more effort into our Giving Tuesday. So Giving Tuesday was a big success for us last year. We raised more than $30,000 and that was the most we'd ever raised in one day. To make that happen, we reached out to our fosters at the time because we didn't have any animals actually in the shelter and asked them to do videos with their animals so that they could show why EHS is so important and why they support us and why other people should support us. And we found that that was really successful. We ramped up the number of e-blasts that we sent out to our supporters, and we were always looking to include a story about one of our animals in those e-blasts so that people could feel connected to the shelter and really have a feeling of what we're doing and the animals that we're helping. So we also really heavily relied on social media. We've got a great following on Instagram and Facebook. And so when we were doing individual posts on the holiday campaign, we would be asking for donations and offering up the different activities that we had. But then we would also try and include the holiday campaign, even if it was just about a story about a dog or cat that we had. For Tori and her team, storytelling and engagement of donors across all their fundraising channels and social media was key to their success. But nominees were also evaluated on the success and impact of their campaign, including total amount of funds raised. Tori shares some pretty impressive numbers with us. In 2019, we had raised about $75,000 and we were trying to improve on that. So we were looking at about 95,000, maybe 100,000 that we could be going for. And we knew that this was going to be an ambitious target. It was the largest that we were looking to raise in one campaign had never been done before. So it took a lot of work, a lot of those different activities. But we ended up in the end, we actually raised $150,000. It just showed our supporters were really there for us. And now that just means we're trying to do it again this year. So we're confident that this is something that we can now do now that it has been done. We're going to try and do it again. We'd love to know what the impact has been on your organization of winning this award, your team, and and the well-being of the people that you work with. We're actually having a town hall for our uh, organization, a virtual town hall. So we're going to make sure that that's front and center to make everybody aware that this is something that we've won, we can be really proud of, because our volunteers, the ones that are in the shelters, they may not see other people, because if you're on a shift working one day, you don't see the other people. We've got a lot of people working at home, uh, the fundraising team, a lot of us are virtual, so we don't see each other. And so it's not always clear all the work that's going into everything. So having an award like this to show our volunteers to say, a little pat on their back, like we are doing a great job, it's amazing. So we're definitely gonna be spreading the word at our town halls. It was great timing. In 2021, every nonprofit professional and organization faced a very difficult time with increased demands on services, fewer resources, and competing personal challenges for staff and volunteers, making our workplaces much more stressful and prone to burnout. At Charity Village, we thought it was time for us to celebrate organizations and people who've gone the extra mile to build supportive and healthy workplaces that prioritize wellness and mental health. The next category of awards is Excellence in Workplace Mental Health. The winner of the Best Nonprofit Employer for Workplace Mental Health with under 20 staff is the Mosaic Institute. As Rachel Mansell, Vice President of Operations, explains, Mosaic tries to walk its talk when it comes to integrating internally what it works on externally for its clients as part of its mission. Mosaic's mission is to equip people with the tools to dismantle prejudice in their own communities. And so for us, it's really about walking the talk, you know, starting that work internally so that we are equipped and able to do it externally. And so for us, what we really talked about in the application was the fact that we put people first. We really do our best to create an equitable and inclusive workplace. And a large part of that is recognizing as equity demands that people have different needs. And when it comes to mental health, that is certainly true. What needs to be in place to support one person is going to look and feel differently than what needs to be in place for another. 
So from an organizational perspective, it's about having that flexibility and having that flexibility built into our policies. So for us, we ended up going remotely quite suddenly and quite unexpectedly. So that in and of itself had quite a significant toll on our team. So one of the first things that we did was really connect with each team member and check in with them, find out how they're doing and what they needed. And we applied for and received funding to support our team capitally through through the pandemic. But going back to that concept of equity, that looks different for different people. So for some, it was having a desk because they've never had to work from home. They didn't have a desk. For others, it meant noise canceling headphones because other members of their family were in a similar space also having calls all day. So it was really taking a step back and, you know, understanding that for our team to be equipped and to feel comfortable and to feel able to show up to work, that looks differently for different people. We also moved to a more flexible workplace structure. We have core hours when everyone is expected to be online and available but we move to a little bit more of a deliverables based system where, you know, you get your work done when you're able to get your work done. And again, that looks differently for everyone these days. We implemented dedicated team building time because we're such a small team. It could feel siloed even before COVID and during COVID when we're all working remotely even more so. So we have a lunch and learn every other week where we take turns leading it, Sometimes they're quite formal. Most of the times they're quite informal. And the entire goal of that is to get everyone talking and connecting. And it's not only the five of us. Our student interns are invited to that. Our leadership, when they're available, it really creates a sense of camaraderie and that we are all in it together because we are. For the winner of the Best Workplace Mental Health in the Over 20 Staff category, it's all about people. Not surprising when you understand the organization is called Park People. As Jody Lassman, Director of Marketing and Sponsorship, explains, the people are as important as the parks. In fact, they're inextricably linked. Park People has always been very thoughtful about its people. People is half of our name. You know, we've always been very dedicated to making sure that our staff are happy and taking care of themselves at the same time that they're taking care of their work. We've always prevented staff from doing things like working late or answering emails during vacation or being overworked. That was always part of the park people culture. And it's what makes us pretty unique in the nonprofit sector. After all, burnout is a classic nonprofit condition. And we've just always been super mindful that we want our people to be happy. And I think part of that is obviously the people who are making those decisions, but it's also like parks. That's what we stand for. It was really based on the insight that different people need different things. So for some people, we had a walk-in club that we created with prizes for people who took a certain number of steps every week and we kind of made it fun and gamified the daily practice of walking. For some people, it was about counseling and having access to free online counseling services because they needed to talk about stuff that was going on in work. But also some people just were buried under the weight of childcare or caretaking responsibilities and needed a one-on-one way to confidentially share with somebody. During the summer, we marked off a summer slowdown period where we had meeting free times, where we gave staff extra days off that were kind of coupled with long weekends. And we really staffed up. We hired summer students and other folks to kind of just take the weight off people because we could see as we were entering into the summer, which is park season, Ultimately, if I could say it in the most concise way, we put our money where our mouth was. We actually instituted programs and invested money in making sure that everybody had what they needed to be okay during a kind of unprecedented period. One of the striking developments that the pandemic has had was to highlight in stark relief the inequities that certain groups of people suffered the most, creating heightened urgency for the need for diversity, equity, and inclusion within society generally, and especially within the workplace. 
heightened awareness of Canada's shameful history in its treatment of Indigenous peoples, and global movements like Black Lives Matter, and demands for equity and inclusion by LGBTQ2 individuals and persons with disabilities, have been gaining traction and building momentum in the last year, causing the nonprofit sector to take a long, hard look in the mirror to face its own challenges related to systemic racism, discrimination, and oppression. At Charity Village, we felt it was important to celebrate those organizations and people who've demonstrated their commitment to socially responsible hiring and onboarding practices and how they're actively incorporating policies that encourage diversity, equity, inclusion, community outreach, and accessibility within their workplace. Winners in this category, Skills for Change and Pride at Work Canada, are two outstanding organizations that meld the core values of their missions to their own approach to workplace equity and inclusion. To Sarana Sandy, CEO of Skills for Change, when your organization is dedicated to developing the skills of newcomers to Canada, living diversity and inclusion within the workplace and reflecting the community it serves is literally part of its mission. It meant everything from the board level all the way to our frontline staff and our volunteers. Because each and every one of our colleagues are working towards creating a welcoming space, virtual workspace as it is right now for us, and in service delivery. They are very proud of, of being recognized for that diversity, for who they are and what they each bring to create that diverse organization. Our board is a very diverse board. Gender, race, ethnicities, backgrounds, skills, levels, capabilities, all of that diversity bring together good governance for the organization. So they're very proud that they've worked really hard and have that mandate at the board level. Then we move to our leadership team. It's a diverse team, gender, again, racial backgrounds, newcomers to Canada who've never worked in Canada, but able to use their skills at the senior executive and management level, feeling valued for that, and being part of an organization that lived those values. For us, the diversity, equity, and inclusion and a bigger focus on belonging is key to our corporate effectiveness and in terms of building a workplace where employees feel valued and supported and engaged. So we do that to be inclusive of and sensitive to diverse backgrounds, um, both at the leadership team level and our frontline staff level. So we look at uh, the people that we serve. Who are they? What are their experiences? When they walk into our various centers, do people reflect their background, their languages, their cultural connections, their understanding of the different lived experience, whether someone is coming in with a mental health challenge or coming from a low-income background and trying to navigate the workplace, a language challenge, are they coming with focus on needs specific to their gender, or is it a senior client, or is it a youth? Like skills for change, Reflecting its mission within its own workplace is essential to Pride at Work Canada. Jade Pachette, Manager of Programs for Pride at Work, explains how winning the award for DEI was a kind of self-affirmation for the organization. It was an affirming experience. We're an organization that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the work that we do. So it's one of the things that's actually important to us that's part of our plan is to walk the talk or move the communication if we want to be as inclusive as possible and really follow in the footsteps of what we encourage others to do, which as a small nonprofit that historically until recently didn't have much of a staff team, It's certainly been also still a journey for us in terms of getting those policies and procedures and and everything together. But our internal chat when we won just blew up with people being excited and really affirmed by the fact that we're honored in such a way. As Jade explains, transformational growth and change was an opportunity to rethink and retool the organization's focus on diversity and inclusion in all aspects of the workplace and its culture. We're different than a number of the other nonprofits in that we do operate under this member services model, but our members are organizations large employers and then we also provide other additional programming for the community and so all of our programming is focused around making sure that workplaces are inclusive of two-spirit queer and trans communities and really trying to create space for that conversation both in the education that we do through webinars member workshops 
roundtable discussions, public panels, networking events like Rendezvous, which is for women and non-binary folks, Matrices, which is for trans, non-binary, and agender job seekers and professionals. But I think the thing that really kind of moved the bar for us in terms of the award was the fact that we've gone through a lot of changes in the last year. Back in December 2020, we had a staff team of four full-timers and one part-timer. Now we have a full-time staff team of nine and two part-timers. And we really, instead of just kind of said, okay, let's go, 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 do more, 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 let's work on our internal culture, make sure that all of our members of our team feel like they have all the things that they need. It's like doing all staff mental health first aid training, providing additional supports to folks like myself who went from having no direct reports to having five. So I got some help in regards to how do you organize your team in the most inclusive way as possible, making sure that our orientation package is as inclusive as possible, making sure that we have our employee handbook, that our benefits are inclusive. And for example, we're one of the few nonprofits we know where we pay the employee portion of benefits. So we've really been trying to create that environment on a virtual basis so that even the employees who don't come into the office still have that connection and that experience and that virtual environment is the one that we prioritize. Every Monday we meet up, but we don't just talk about what's going on that week. We also talk about how are people feeling? Does anybody need to convey anything? And then we also spend half the meeting thinking of big picture issues, like how do we think about equity, diversity, and inclusion in the work that we do, but also internally. I really believe that taking a step back, making sure that you have space for your team to build and connect together led to that award. We all know that the future's strength and resilience of the sector is its ability to engage and attract youth as volunteers, staff, donors, and future leaders. Now let's move to our final category, where we look to the future and shine the spotlight on youth engagement. Winners in this category are Layup Youth Basketball in Toronto and the Daily Hive in Vancouver. According to Veronica Bulitsky, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Daily Hive, Involving youth from the bottom all the way to the top of the organization is key to their success. For sure. City High, we're a nonprofit based in Metro Vancouver, and our mission is to transform the way that young people are engaged in shaping their cities, in planning, in decision making, and in tackling really complex urban issues. And we really emerged based on a gap that we saw on a city level where when decisions were being made about affordability, about climate action, about housing, any sort of issues, usually youth weren't included in that decision making. And so we work on building the capacity of youth to be able to engage in building their skills, knowledge and agency through civic education programs. And then we also work directly with municipal governments and other institutions to transform their youth engagement practices from the inside. And I think something that's really key to us is, well, first off, we're youth founded and youth run. I'm one of the two uh, co-founders alongside Tessica Trong. And we really were built based off of lots of conversations with youth in the city. We had tons of youth focus groups at the beginning that kind of led to our birth as an organization. And we have a full youth staff team, a youth board. We hire youth facilitators. So everybody that we employ is youth. And we really are youth centered and youth guided whether it's a program that we're running for youth or whether it's a program that we're running for a municipal government. We always make sure that we're centering youth's needs and prioritizing that above everything else. For Layup Youth Basketball, it's equally crucial that youth are involved in the programs and the services that the nonprofit offers to youth and that their outreach is customized to the needs of the communities they serve. We asked Christopher Penrose, Director of Programs and Operations, and Britannia Brown, Head Coach, how that works. We put a lot of time into engagement of participants, engagement of families, and engagement in community. When we were budgeting for our summer program and we look at all the hours that we logged and just on 
doing calls. Some people are better on text. Some people prefer emails. Some people want voicemail. Some people need multiple call follow-ups. So we don't just put out the information that the registration is open. We really even customize our outreach. You know, we're doing um, our play-at-home kits for the basketball programming that we do. We want to make sure that having a laptop and having all the equipment that you need, having a jersey for girls that need a sports hijab, we provide that as another example. And there are hours and hours and hours of assembling the kits, delivering them, that just goes into people showing up. For me, from a coaching standpoint, because I am one of the head coaches at Layup, it all comes down to preparation. Chris can tap into a few of the things that we do beforehand. Simple thing like calling the kids before a session. We usually do that about an hour before a session, telling them what they need, the equipments that they need, basically building confidence before they show up. Once we're in the programming, the kids usually are happy to see us, especially from a virtual standpoint, because they're in school all day, they're in front of a computer screen, but there's a difference between being in class and being in a program where you want to be at. You're meeting other people, you're seeing familiar faces, you're able to talk about your day. For the kids, it's a exciting atmosphere to be in and a safe place for them to be in. We asked Christopher Penrose what the impact of winning this award had on the organization and the layup team in terms of staff morale and mental health during the pandemic. Before March 2020, we were all on court program. We have basketball courts all across the city and we provide cost-free programming that brings the best of youth work and the best of elite basketball into a safe space. When we can't be on the court, what are we going to do? We did make the decision to go virtual and had great success with the virtual program. You know, registrations filled up really quickly because of the outreach we did and whatnot. And then we pushed and we figured out in the school year how to do contactless basketball. So now how do you restructure a basketball session to not share equipment, not be within six feet of each other? And wearing a mask so you're not, you can't do like super strenuous activities. And our team redesigned that. And then we started doing stuff during the school day and creating virtual school day. So now the kids don't have any equipment. They're just, you know, with their teacher in a virtual classroom and we're coming in to do basketball activities. So that's another new curriculum. And going through all of those iterations and pilots and that we went through in order to keep kids engaged. And we saw physical activity as an essential service. It wasn't frivolous, like physical and mental, emotional well-being that comes from physical activity through the pandemic became so much more needed. And many um, youth in neighborhood improvement areas in Toronto had way less access to that. And so that took a toll on our team because we actually went harder than we've ever gone. So to have that recognition, it makes you feel seen. It's like we see you. It was that charge in our backs and a recharging feeling to be seen and validated for that work. While nonprofit organizations may want to do a better job of engaging young people, it's often individuals who are leading this charge by creating and running programs and initiatives that build bridges with younger generations. The award for Best Contribution to Youth Engagement by an Individual celebrates professionals and leaders who've proven their commitment to attracting young people to their organization as volunteers, employees, or future leaders. The winner in this category is Swabir Sharif, Director of the Good Guides Inner City Youth Mentoring. For Swabir, it's all about empowering youth to become the change makers in their communities. So the Good Guides itself is a provincially registered nonprofit organization, and it's an organization that I founded with some friends a little over a year ago. And we operate with the mandate of putting youth in charge of how we create change. This came from a dislike as a youth of being spoon-fed program after program, and seeing the value instead of encouraging, empowering, and educating youth on how to become that change themselves. So we do this work through our Good Guide Ambassador Program, in which we recruit and work with youth ranging from the ages of 12 to 22, from across all over the GTA. We virtually mentor these youth to create their own local events, initiatives, or projects. And we currently mentor about 30 students per semester who have been simultaneously earning volunteer credits and hours that are applicable to their graduation. 
So I guess you're not only giving the youth that you directly work with that experience that's so important for them, whether it's their volunteer hours or their programming, but you're also making it possible for them to have outreach and impact beyond themselves and in the communities that they're trying to help. Yeah, for sure. Because what I found is oftentimes youth are now kind of expecting for a program or for some exterior, external body to come in and assist them. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to teach empower and to inform them that they have the capabilities to make this change themselves. Oftentimes it's connecting them with the resource or putting them in touch with a specific person, or sometimes it may just be hearing out their ideas and not being so quick to kind of hushing them and listening to what they have to say and just emphasizing their individuality. In fall 2020, with the pandemic-driven restrictions canceling many fundraising events, we launched our own Charity Village crowdfunding platform to support the sector in transitioning to digital tools and virtual fundraising. So at our awards a year later, we announced a special award that recognized excellence in crowdfunding using our platform with winners chosen by a special panel of judges from Charity Village and its crowdfunding advisors. The Pathstone Foundation is the winner of the special award for a Charity Village hosted crowdfunding campaign for its Worry Monster campaign. With only two staff members, Kim Rossi, Director of Philanthropy, and Michelle Bagan, Fundraising Community Engagement Coordinator, pulled together a spectacularly successful crowdfunding campaign to help support their work in offering mental health therapy for children in the Niagara region during the pandemic. Pathstone is a children's mental health organization, and we're supporting the needs of children and youth from the start of their life up to age 18. And we are centered in the Niagara region, so we serve as a population of 455,000. We have had a huge demand for our services through the pandemic, as you can imagine. One of the things we were seeing very clearly was the amount of anxiety among children that were aged 6 to 12. And what we were seeing is through the pandemic with school closures, those children, which are not as social media savvy and don't have that extended friend group beyond their classmates, really lost all their buddies when school closed. And they were worried about them. They were worried they wouldn't see them again. They were worried they would get sick. They were worried about just their world all around them and the safety of all of us. So these little people with these big worries were something that we really wanted to address. And with COVID and sanitization of everything, all of our tools that our therapists and counselors use in sessions were not really usable anymore. Well, Michelle actually had a dinner with some friends and one friend was talking about this worry monster and she snapped a picture of it. And I said, oh my gosh, I was just in a session about crowdfunding. I think that we can do something with this and address the anxiety issues of 42% of our clients at Pathstone. And so it was just like a beautiful melding of ideas that came together and timing was serendipitous. Can you share any specific stories of where the Worry Monster had a huge impact? Well, the Very Hungry Worry Monster campaign, and he's or she's adorable. You can't not love just how soft it is and lovable. For little hands or medium-sized hands or big hands, it's easy to tote around. And we had a six-year-old and we actually got to sit in on a session. Rose was talking in her session about some of her worries and their worries that you would never think a six-year-old would have. She first opened up with, I have 15,000 worries. And she said, I'm worried that something is going to happen to our world and we wouldn't be ready for it. I'm worried that my house is going to break into pieces. It got to the point where these were such big worries for anybody, to be honest with you. No one should be carrying those kinds of worries. Sherry was her therapist and she's a dynamo and really specializes in working with the seven and under group that we see at Pathstone. You know, Sherry had updated me a little ways down the line and said, now Rose is carrying her friend's worries. So she's obviously talking to her friends about it. So once again, that, you know, removes some of the the stigma that's around mental health. I think during the pandemic, everybody struggled at some point. So our empathy and understanding of mental health, I think, is that much more advanced as a result of the pandemic. So if you're looking for a bright spot, that's probably it. Kids that wouldn't sleep in their own bed by themselves now have their worry monster. One named her Violet and takes her to school in her backpack, gives her hugs when she feels she needs one. It still has lasting and large impact. Nonprofit staff 
bring their passion, dedication, and expertise to their work in organizations across Canada, helping to make our country a better and more vibrant place to live. The Most Outstanding Impact Staff Award celebrates outstanding impact by an employee at a nonprofit or charity. That goes to Rebecca Tunnicliffe this year from the British Columbia Parks and Recreation Association, who was nominated by her board with the support of her staff for her outstanding leadership during the crisis that the pandemic brought about. The DC Recreation and Parks Association represents all the municipalities in British Columbia and the staff in those municipalities specifically who work in recreation and parks. So it's been a really tough year, two years, for everyone. And typically the recreation facilities are the heart of a community. So immediately when the pandemic was proclaimed in early March 2020, I, like all CEOs, kind of went into, now what my, is my organization going to be when all of the revenue streams will be stopped, when my members can't have members of the public coming into their facilities to offer that community connectedness, like everything that went to what we do was immediately stopped. So I quickly decided that what we needed to do was to come together as a senior leadership group. So the senior person from each municipality met with me every week to talk about what the impact is and the advocacy we need to do. And and I got onto a couple of really important decision-making tables with the provincial health office to help advise for our sector and really put BCRPA on the map. In fact, the premier mentioned BCRPA one month into the pandemic, talking about how we brought the sector together to really look at what we can do. So we focused on what we could do outdoors and other spaces that we could use to bring people together and to connect with people. I I realized I'm good in leadership in crisis, and I really enjoyed that opportunity to be bold and to bring people together in a new way and to create new relationships with leaders in in government and in other organizations, as well as these senior leaders in my organization. And none of us had had that network before. And now it's the staple of what we do. The nonprofit sector is clearly ripe with innovation and creativity, filled with trailblazers and leaders who see great opportunities to grow and develop into the future. We asked our award winners what advice they might have for other nonprofit professionals and organizations who might want to up their game and strive for excellence in these areas. Let's start with Tori and improving fundraising strategies. Well, I would say that focusing on communications is a good way to go. So if you've got strong communications and you're spreading the word, that's really going to help you go that extra mile. But I would say a lesson that we learned from last year is have various activities that people can be interested in because not everybody is interested in one thing as another. So if you've got a variety of different things, especially for a holiday campaign that's running for about two months. It's nice to keep things fresh, to have new things to be promoting so you're not just going out for the same thing every single time. Rachel Mansell sees a focus on people and flexible policies as critical to supporting mental health in the workplace. Put people first and recognize that putting people first means different things for different people. For myself in the role of operations, that means making sure that my policies are flexible enough to accommodate different needs for different people. But in my role as as a direct supervisor, it means taking the time to check in. If that means I spend five or 10 minutes connecting with my team member as a person and not as the person who's responsible for specific tasks, then that's what it takes. Having an equitable view towards the members of my team, putting people first is really the ultimate strategy that I can suggest, and then recognizing that looks differently for different people and different organizations as well. Jody Lastman agrees with putting people first. In the nonprofit sector, we often let people work to the point of burnout to achieve our very important impact in the world. And it's not a sustainable model. And frankly, it's hypocritical given the focus on impact on the outside, that we care so much about the issues, that we don't dedicate necessarily the same focus or investment on our people and our internal well-being. One of the lessons for sure is it's always worth investing in your people because they are everything and without them we are nothing. Let's move to the diversity, equity and inclusion category and hear from one of our winners with their thoughts and advice. 
Sarana Sandy emphasizes that diversity is an ongoing process of learning. First of all, diversity is a continual journey, so ensure that you don't have an end point, it's not going to stop. Then the second piece is to figure out what it is you want to do in terms of creating an inclusive organization. What would that look like and how would you ensure that the people that you bring in that will contribute to the inclusivity feel that they belong? There's value there. So the first step is to ensure that this strategy on DNI starts at the top, that there is executive champions and leaders who believe in it. Secondly, that there's metrics for that and there's accountability for it. It is not an HR function to create a diverse organization. It's everyone's responsibility. And then once you have the executive champion that is part of your strategic priorities embedded in your strategic plan, that people are held accountable for it. For Jade Pichette, it means that DEI is made part of every aspect of your organization's workday and workplace. I would say start with making sure that equity and diversity and inclusion isn't the afterthought. It's the before thought and making sure that it's integrated every week that your team connects you're always thinking about these things. I know a previous organization I worked for, we, every meeting that we had, we had a DEI activity to start our meeting, just so that our focus and our thoughts were there. I think it's also important to provide access for your employees to be able to give feedback about what they need. And being in a management role, I know that Although I've created a fairly welcoming environment for my team, at least I hope so, there's still things that you don't want to say to a supervisor. There is always things that even when you're in an inclusive environment, you might have hesitancy towards. So giving your employees both that space to express themselves of what they need, as well as the space to develop is really the secret sauce. Here are the winners of the Youth Engagement Awards with their ideas for engaging youth. First, Veronica Bulitsky, then Britannia Brown and Swabir Sharif. I think when organizations are designing programs or processes, especially when we're working on systems change, especially when we're working with demographics that have been systemically marginalized, the most important thing to do is to include those demographics, include those people, include those users or participants of the organization from the very first step of design of programs and processes. Youth isn't a monolith, it's not a homogenous category, and there's so many different demographics of youth that have different assets and also experience different barriers to participation. So for organizations that are looking to engage youth um, I think the most important thing is to look at youth who are facing the most barriers to participation and design any sort of youth engagement around being able to meet their needs in the best way that they can. I think it comes to investment in your staff and the members in your organization, right? You need your staff being able to produce a great program. Also, when you take care of your staff, it trickles down to the kids because if your staff is able to perform at 100% every single time they show up, that energy goes into your participants and your stakeholders, right? So the biggest thing is investing and providing the resources that's needed when it's needed. Always remain true and faithful to your values, first and foremost, and then the values of the organization in which you represent. And then also specifically when we're dealing with youth, instead of trying to spoon feed youth ways in which to keep them engaged in the community, instead try giving them the keys to the kitchen work with them and allow them to discover who they are and what they have to contribute to this world. Our crowdfunding winner, Michelle Bagan, has this advice to give. For me, the takeaway from this experience is that not to be afraid to ask for help. I mean, there's this perception that we are the professionals and therefore we shouldn't be asking anybody for anything. We know it all. And our thinking is that's that's just flawed thinking. Although with the Worry Monster, we were confident in the product we were pitching we weren't so sure about the fundraising aspect of it and crafting the perfect fundraiser. It was the first time doing a crowdfunding campaign. So we had a million questions. And so what we decided to do was to go to the experts. Mm -hmm. We hashed out ideas. They were great with feedback and provide a lot of constructive criticism, which ultimately turned out to be the campaign that won us the award. So mm -hmm. that collaboration, that feedback, all of that meant the world to us. And our impact winner, Rebecca Tunnicliffe, offers this. As a nonprofit, I think it's really important to know who you serve. So your most important stakeholder is the board of directors and to have their confidence that 
you as a CEO are going to help them be successful, make them successful, knowing what they want, what their priorities are, and then how to go about it. And I've developed a very close relationship with my board where communication is strategic. So I'm not messaging them constantly, but I'm strategic about what and when I share with them and created a real sense of trust and connectedness. Congratulations to our exceptional winners and all our amazing finalists. All of them demonstrate extraordinary commitment and excellent achievements in making the nonprofit sector the commendable and crucial part of Canadian society that it is, where heart meets commitment and impact in our communities. We're so honored to have presented these awards to truly outstanding contributors to the betterment of their organizations, their communities, the nonprofit sector, and Canada. We also want to recognize the award winners who were not able to take part in this podcast. The Jane Goodall Institute of Canada, Hospice Aurelia and Mariposa House Hospice, Sophia Jen Mohammed for the Canadian Cancer Society, Stephen Watt of Northern Lights Canada, Nicole Thibodeau of Future Possibilities for Kids, and Cora mcguire Surrett of the Ontario Native Women's Association. You can learn more about all of our amazing 2021 winners and hear the full interviews on CharityVillage.com. Charity Village is proud to be the Canadian source for nonprofit news, employment, funding, HR, and e-learning, and so much more. Please take a moment to check out our website at CharityVillage.com. In our next episode, we examine how the pandemic has had dramatic and far-reaching impacts on the state of mental health throughout the sector. Our guests will be Steve Lurie, former Executive Director of the Canadian Mental Health Association Toronto Branch, Renzia Mellis, founder of Integral Workplace Health and Certified Psychological Health and Safety Advisor, Raksha Bayana from the Bayana Family Foundation and an advocate for the sector, and Pam Apal, Policy Advisor for the Ontario Nonprofit Network. Join us next time on Charity Village Connects.